Welcome to State of Mind, this is Julian Royce. Today's episode is a good one. Today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Jen Pfizer. Jen has been at the forefront of psychedelic assisted therapy for many years now. She served as the supervisor and clinical director of Innate Path, and I believe that Innate Path was one of the first psychedelic assisted therapy clinics in the country, and they work with a particular model of psychotherapy called somatic therapy, which means body, coming into the body, and it's often contrasted with so-called talk therapy. Uh, because sometimes when we are talking, we're in our conceptual mind, and somatic therapy is a way to access the information, memories, wisdom held in our body, often at an unconscious or subconscious level. And Jen has a background in Buddhist psychology, as well as somatic psychotherapy, and she helped develop the model of therapy that Innate Path uses. And I got to do a training with Innate Path, which was great. Uh, talk about that with Jen. So it was a great conversation, and uh, she has a wealth of wisdom and insight to offer. And we ended up talking a lot about cannabis, more than I expected, but cannabis is one of the two uh, widely legal, available psychedelic medicines that we have, the other being ketamine. But cannabis, as um, I talk about in this conversation with Jen, has a lot of stigma and um, kind of cultural baggage around it that I think prevents people from seen it at times as a psychedelic and as a medicine that can be really useful in the context of therapy, but it definitely can be when it's used in the right way. And staying on this topic of psychedelic assisted therapy, I recently published an article called The Rapidly Changing Societal Attitudes Towards Psychedelics. You can find it on my website, estateofmindcounseling.org, and it's more of a, takes more of a bigger political sociological perspective uh, and I give some of the main reasons I see of why our society's attitudes are shifting towards drugs in general and psychedelics in particular. Um, so check that out. So feel free to send, send me any feedback on it. And there was one thing that came out for me that stuck out for me in particular when researching this article, and that is the immense violence in Mexico that is a direct result of our war on drugs. It's just, it's, it's really mind-blowing. But just to share with you here briefly, in 2016, Mexico was declared the second most deadliest war zone in the world, with over 23,000 fatalities, far surpassing the death toll in Iraq and Af Afghanistan. Uh, with the surprising caveat that it was achieved with no tanks, artillery, or traditional armies meeting in combat, it is estimated that over 300,000 homicides have occurred from the cartel violence in Mexico since 2006, a staggering number that far surpasses the number of U.S. troops killed in Vietnam. Um, this just seems like a huge issue that isn't talked about enough. So I just wanted to highlight that. There's a lot of other reasons and points that I make in the article. So feel free to check that out again on my website. One other announcement, I'm going to be offering a psychedelic integration group. It's going to be happening the first and third Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. There'll be more information about that on my website. But if you're looking for a group in which to learn some new skills, some new techniques, and to share and process and learn how to integrate the takeaways and understandings and insights from your own experiences, whether they're psychedelic or not, doesn't really matter. Um, I think it's really applicable to everyone, but it is intended for people in psychedelic assisted therapy or who have experience with psychedelics from the past, uh, partly because a lot of times a psychedelic experience can be very big and there often is a lack of integration afterwards. And so that can cause problems. And at the very least, it means that you're not getting the most benefit out of it that you could be. So please um, send me a message to learn more. You can email me at estateofmindcounsel at gmail.com or through my website, estateofmindcounseling.org. Thank you so much. And without further ado, I bring you Jen Pfizer. Here today with Jen Pfizer. Jen, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. So I'm Jen Pfizer. I'm uh, I used to be the clinical director at Innate Path, which was well, it still is. I mean, Innate Path still exists, but um, we used to be a clinic that we opened in 2018, and um, we we specialized in PTSD using psychedelics 
and a somatic oriented therapy model. So when we opened the clinic in 2018, we started by offering sessions that were ketamine assisted and then also sessions that were cannabis assisted. And I think we might have been the first people to to do that, go in the cannabis realm because cannabis isn't, uh, well, it doesn't have much of a reputation for being something that can be used like a psychedelic in therapy. But if you're working from a somatic point of view or a subconscious point of view, then, and you're not trying to talk through something and get insight, you know, Mm -hmm. cannabis is a huge um, tool in the therapeutic environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And now we were open as a clinic for three years and then COVID came and it really changed the dynamics of what we could do because our work was very, it was important that you're in person, you're Mm -hmm. able to like use touch in the sessions. And so uh, we kind of ended up you know, like having fewer clients and then mm. staff left. And then, so we just changed direction. And, um, and in 2021, <laughs> I lose the years, 2021, um, we started offering trainings on uh, the model that we use, which had expanded over the years. And, yeah, and that's, that's what we're doing now. And I had the good fortune to, in the, one of the trainings mm-hmm. that just ended recently. So, yeah, that's great. That's how we met. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many things I could ask you about, but just to, I thought the training was wonderful and I just you. resonated so deeply with it because I felt the elements of Buddhism and mm-hmm. all of that, mindfulness, the somatic approach, feeling the body and how to work with trauma and then bringing in medicine, psychedelic medicine. I wonder if, like, when people come to you for psychedelic assisted therapy, like you said, like cannabis doesn't have that reputation of being used in that way. So it's new for a lot of people to think mm-hmm. about it in that way. Do you see a process where a client will try either cannabis or ketamine and then their actual experience of it in the context of therapy, then, then they understand in a totally different way than when they, the ideas they had about it before they came to you, if that makes sense. Yeah. It um, seems like a big part of what <laughs> I've noticed way. too. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And a lot of people in the training, because, because, um, the, the training is small group and um, the people, the, the participants do their own work using cannabis and ketamine. And most people switch it up. So they get that experience of using cannabis for therapy. Um, but we, when we first opened, um, we started with this group of vets. That was our oh, first yeah. thing. Like, out, the, out of the gate, we, we uh, tried to do a little pilot study where we collected data and it was just kind of like pro bono and we mm. worked with this group and we knew so one they, of the people in the, in the group. They were all from the military? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it was uh, a, a group that had combat PTSD. Wow. Okay. Uh, mostly from the Iraq War, okay. but we also had somebody that was from the Gulf War. And, and they were all involved. The, the reason that we did it was because uh, a friend of ours who was um, a cannabis activist for vets ran um, this nonprofit called Veterans for Natural Rights. And, and um, so oh, they say, were... Say the name of that again? Veterans for Natural Rights. Natural Rights, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a really neat group. Cool. And they just we kind of collected volunteers from their community Mm. and they were all uh, cannabis activists and and they use cannabis pretty um, (laughs) intensely on a daily basis to manage PTSD symptoms, which is really, really interesting. So they, when they came in, we gave them the option of using ketamine or cannabis Uh and they all picked cannabis, which I found to be really interesting Oh, that is interesting. Um, because they use such high doses. Okay. So, I mean, in my more limited experience, it's, it's been the opposite where people, I, you know, like we could do, use cannabis, we could use ketamine in terms of like legal psychedelic assisted therapy. And 99% of people I've talked to about it have been like, well, cannabis, like they have all these ideas like uh-huh. that's, you know, recreational or that's like yeah. going to make me, you know, forgetful and get the munchies. And so they, super they gravitate towards ketamine because <laughs> it seems more clinical and more... Mm-hmm. Um, 
but yeah, it's just that's fascinating to like how just the ideas that we have about something and how they change when the actual experience of it. So yeah, well, if you if cannabis is something you feel really safe with, mm. and you're holding things that you know are scary, you're gonna choose the safe route, and you think you know you know these guys are soldiers or men and women were in the group. Oh, okay. Um, they're soldiers, they're tough, and they are. Um, and they're holding stuff that's real scary. Yeah, sure. So they all chose cannabis, and it was it was really funny because how, how they many, were, How many sessions did they do? They ended up doing, um, well, originally we had uh, set up to do 12, and then we ended oh, up extending it. Oh, because okay. so a lot of sessions. At, at about 12 sessions, um, they were... We kind of were assessing it anecdotally at about six. They felt like they were about sixty percent through the PTSD. Oh. So it's not really actually that. Okay. I mean, these are two-hour sessions. Like one a week for mm -hmm. twelve weeks. For twelve weeks, so like yeah. three months of uh, two-hour sessions a week in a yeah. group. We did cool. a group, um, and then uh, and they had made very good progress in that's resolving great. the PTSD. That's awesome to hear. Mm -hmm. Did they? Talk about like their experience doing that in the context of a therapy session as being very different than when they would have cannabis outside. Yeah, I was going to get to that. Or, I know yeah. I'm, I'm just saying this no, no, no. Long, <laughs> the long way, but <laughs> but because it was funny because they because they were making fun of us uh -huh. and they were because you know they had all been in therapy you know through the um, VA and they're like I sit around on my couch all day and smoke weed how <laughs> you know like come on sort of a thing and uh, but because what we do in the therapy is we have them, we don't, we're not sitting there talking. Mm. Um, we're having people, you know, like turn inward, like that mm. interoception. Yeah. Where you start to track uh, how you're feeling, mm. you know, so you can start to sense that there's tension or there's fear or there's, you know, and can uh, another thing about cannabis that I'd love to talk about a little bit here um, next but um, but they thought it was hilarious, and then they came into the session, and they would do less cannabis cannabis during the session that they than they did at home. Oh, interesting! And after the first session, they're like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> but there's there's some videos out there because they did some uh, videos, um, and we had uh, my my former partner put some of them up on YouTube and stuff where they talk about it, and it's just so funny because they were. <laughs> Their, their jaws just dropped to the floor. It was a completely different experience. I love that. I love hearing that. And, it, and it's all yeah. about set and setting mm -hmm. and, and what you do, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, I found that. I mean, it's, it's rare for people to... It's a different thing. It's, it's a different context, a different situation. Um, but, yeah, I think a lot of people, when they use cannabis more recreationally, there's some, like, activity that goes along with it, or they're watching TV, or they're listening to music or dancing, or... Mm -hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with any of that, but it's totally different than being guided into your body and feeling things that you might not even know were there to be felt. Mm -hmm. And actually, what you're describing is a, like this kind of modality of like not talking as much. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, um, I think that's you know, that's really powerful when it's when it's held in the right way. Yeah, yeah I mean, you could even think about it. I, just as you were saying that, I thought of something, which is, you know, we were when we're in an ordinary state of consciousness most of the time, let's mm -hmm. say not altered, um, and we go around listening to music and dancing and watching TV, and then we go to a therapy appointment. And in the therapy appointment, that ordinary state of consciousness is transformed. Mm. If, you, if, you, if you tap into you know, the subconscious, you know, the nervous system, stuff like yeah. that. So cannabis heightens, you know, your sensation. It heightens um, uh, your mind in a certain way. And it also, and this is what I was going to say, it has this, uh, we all are familiar with this if we use cannabis, but it has this ability to kind of um, remove his, Habitual mind, mm. and all of a sudden, um, you're you're having to you're you're not in that. You have to think about it. Like 
this is my experience mm-hmm. anyway, like all of a sudden I have to think about why I'm hungry right now. Am I really hungry? Am I not <laughs> hungry? You know, something yeah. like that, where you're just kind of questioning everything. And um, Yeah, yeah. And so I think if you're just on your own or maybe with friends or whatever, people can get like stuck in those in thought loops. And they, some people, you know, talk about like cannabis making that way worse or more intense. Like I've experienced that. But I think if you're uh, with a therapist and you're doing it, they can guide you back in your body, which mm-hmm. takes you out of those thought loops. And then you can kind of have a new perspective on them. And there's probably some reason why you're thinking that, right? And so mm-hmm. just having another, you know, human, the therapist there to like reflect what's happening and help you see it with more perspective, maybe shed shame or guilt or blame around it, whatever's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much, so many different ways it could go, but it makes sense to me what you're saying. <laughs> and I hope... <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to give, I want to give people listening like a new perspective because it, cannabis of all the substances has so much baggage around it, right? Mm-hmm. So much cultural baggage and ideas and um, yeah, just the question of like if you could take, you know, if you could magically remove all that conditioning and just experience it for what it is, like what would that be like? And I think therapy can help help us get there. Right. And if you have a therapy that is primarily... Um, Tracking experience. Hmm. So like when we get lost in those thought loops or we have paranoia that comes up with, with cannabis, um, you know, can, we go into like self-doubt or, or whatever and we can and have a really bad time. But if, you're, but if what you're looking for in therapy is that direct experience, mm-hmm. which you can always touch into, that's like the ground of, you know, our existence. We can always have tap into what we're experiencing. Mm. And then all of a sudden, you're shifting the focus back to something really grounded. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think, I think um, again, just having someone else who could, like, bring you out of the thought loops if you're getting stuck there, and then you can, like, oh, yeah, that happened. And, like, to be with that process could, could really release something or show you something or heal something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so you worked with the vets doing that, and it sounds like you had pretty good results. Um, we had good results and it was at, right at the beginning. So I, I was using, uh, I was using that group to, for a bunch of different reasons. They were very sweet. And, um, we used it to test the, uh, the group model and mm-hmm. we used, we used the group to train the first therapists. Oh, interesting. So I did all the sessions and then there would be a, a trainee, oh. um, in all the sessions with me. Which was really fun. So they were getting two therapists in their room. Mm-hmm. That makes a big difference. It does, because it feels like you have a team on your side. Yeah. And uh-huh. I think they all felt that it was very supportive. Um, cool. One of the other things that su- surprised me in it, because I had used ketamine in private, or not ketamine, but cannabis in private practice with a few clients. That's uh-huh. how I think it, that's how we brought it to the clinic, because yeah. I had clients that were going home. Because we use somatic processing, they were going home, and they would... They would uh, say, uh, use cannabis at night to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were going into spontaneous processing mm. at, at home by themselves. So Like they learned how to do the somatic processing with you and then it would start happening on its own almost. Mm-hmm. That's, at home. that's powerful. That's awesome. And they're like, oh my gosh, this started <laughs> happening when I was smoking weed at home. And I'm like, well, so, <laughs> well maybe we should try that in the session. <laughs> yeah. But so when you first started using cannabis in private practice as a therapist, I mean, that was, like, new ground you were breaking. Like, were you maybe one of the first people to be doing that? I think so. (laughs) As far as I know, unless people are doing it secretly. Was that when it became medically legal? Yeah, it was recreationally legal in in Colorado. Um, Like, well before that. okay. Like, a couple years. Well, I don't know, maybe not that long. But it was recreationally legal here. You could buy it at the store. Okay. Um... So it was just, you know. Well, how did you take that leap and, and want to do that? Well. Because it's, pretty, it's a pretty radical thing. The, the last couple of years that I was in graduate school, so I went to Naropa and was in the contemplative program, and I was studying uh, Buddhism and meditation, which, I, which is very experience-based. Hmm. Um, and then I got into the somatic stuff after I graduated. But right around that time, MAPS started the phase two study here in Boulder for um, MDMA for PTSD. Oh, yeah. So, like, my former um, business partner at, at Innate Path was one of the therapists originally in that, in that second phase of um, 
uh, phase two study. Mm -hmm. And and we were doing somatic work and realized that MDMA was amazing for somatic work. So, like, it was just this really, um, it was it was this huge support and it really changed the whole game i mean we were we were doing stuff that was highly technical to try to ease the system to get into some of those really tough um subconscious places that were protected you have to be you have to like peel the peel the onion very skillfully mm. and, and slowly but when with mdma uh it's like you don't you have so much support and the body is, hmm. it, it's like the body has this level of trust in it mm-hmm. and it will just allow the person to process on really deep levels. Well, we were watching that mm-hmm. and just like, oh my gosh, we can't wait till MDMA is available. It sucks to go to work and have to do this, what we call dry. <laughs> <laughs> dry meaning no Dry meaning no psychedelics. Yes, and, um, yeah, so we were doing this slow slog, but it was still like groundbreaking. The work that the somatic work is amazing in and of yeah. itself. Um, so in so we were still doing this work that was really exciting. But then we saw this other option, and it was just like, hmm. ugh. So when I had clients, so um, uh, and we were and we were training in it. So it, we had this team and everybody's clients started doing different things. Like one client would go to a ketamine uh, clinic and ask the therapist to go with them. And that's how we figured out that ketamine uh-huh. would work. Okay. And then, um, and then I had clients that were bringing the, bringing like edibles. I had a client that, that made their own edibles and um, they bring it, bring them to sessions and we would have these, I mean, they look like shamanic journeys with a somatic component. They were Sounds almost like an organic amazing. process that started like, coming <laughs> partly from the clients. Like, oh, yeah. Intro, yeah, the cannabis here. totally okay. came from the clients. So did the ketamine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so what would you say to um, someone who's listening to this and is skeptical, especially around cannabis? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Not sure. I mean, I think I, I think this work, when you're working with trauma and you're working with um, the subconscious and you're mm. working with body and you're working with psychedelics, you know, you're, you're in the deep end of the pool. Mm. So um, the, yeah. the trauma that we work with is no joke. Yeah. It's not, yeah. It's almost like in working with trauma, it's like whatever, whatever helps, whatever really works, right? That's kind of. We need solutions. We need, we, yeah. We need solutions. And just, just having more tools and more options. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and yeah. doing this kind of work isn't for every, um, for every client. Right. It takes, it takes um, a strong desire to get to the other side because you have to go through what you're keeping at bay. Mm-hmm. And I, and I want to say that lightly because, you know, I don't want to get real heavy. <laughs> but it's, it could be some really intense stuff. And yeah. It's like, it's kind of like I see. Well, we're, we're talking about the, like the heaviest stuff there is, basically. Like the, exactly. Like rape, trauma, exactly. war, whatever, you name it. And finding ways to help people to process that, heal, it, heal from it, and move on. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's deep work. I have profound respect for it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think, I mean, I wonder if like you talked about the soldiers with PTSD using cannabis a lot to maybe mitigate the symptoms and then learning how to actually process it somatically at a deeper level. And I, I think that like that process could then transform their relationship with cannabis. So maybe in the it, long run, they, they need to use it less. They, maybe they don't, you know, that kind of thing. It did, and it was surprising. Okay, that's so clear. And We yeah. learned something from that, which is um, it started transforming their relationship to cannabis in that they started, like, spontaneously processing when they were, like, 
out of the bar with their friends or, you know, oh, yeah. at times when they didn't want to, but they, but the cannabis would, was such, it, it became such a well-worn path with mm. the somatic work that their body, they just like start going into like what we call like waves. Mm. And, um, so it did, it changed their relationship and I think it ultimately was fine, but that respect of it, that aspect of it, I mean, mm-hmm. but the, But now I talk to people that use cannabis to manage PTSD carefully um, about maybe not using it during therapy Mm. because you want to be able to keep the management strategies while you're going through the hard stuff. You don't want to ruin a management strategy by making it a processing yeah. Of strategy. <laughs> so, like, if someone uses cannabis to manage PTSD, mm. I recommend that they use ketamine to process. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's beautiful. Yeah, that makes sense. And then it's they don't like, get it's like confused. A, it's like an ally in their life, mm-hmm. and um, to let it be more for comfort or for management rather than for the deep processing. Because mm-hmm. a lot of people um, that I've, I've worked with will use cannabis a little bit at night to go to sleep. And I guess at the end of the day, if it's like you have a choice between not sleeping very well and doing that, I mean, it's not not the worst thing in the world. And if it's helping you get a good night's sleep, you know, then then great. So yeah, it's way better than you know the sleeping pills. Yeah, be nutty. (laughs) Yeah, there's been some more research coming out about that. Um, The hypnotics. (laughs) (laughs) There's been some bizarre cases of people taking sleeping pills for years, and then they'll like. get up in the middle of night and like walk around and like open their fridge and uh-huh. do things and have no memory of it the next day and it's scary. <laughs> it's not not a joke. <laughs> yeah. 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 I some of my clients have had some really weird stories. Mm. And you know, it's not their fault. It's like a it's like a prescribed um <clears throat> it's prescribed by your doctor and you think that it's safe enough and they find themselves in the car. I didn't mm. stuff oh, like yeah. that. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but one other aspect of the cannabis that I uh, was going to bring up, which I think is really interesting, and I, I don't talk about it a whole lot, mm. um, maybe a little bit in the training, but when we talk about parts work. But if you have any experience with cannabis, mm. it has this, you know, a lot of people, it's kind of a joke, right? Like, if you smoke a lot of weed, what is it? Cab- that, that horror movie, Cabin in the Woods. You yeah. know, it was the character that, that smoked a lot of weed that um, was seeing through what was happening. Did you see that? Yeah, it's like, a long time ago, yeah. It's like they're, they get set up to be in this, cat, this group, and it's all the, you know, archetypical horror story characters. And they get... <laughs> I don't they're going to be, like, gonna be like sacrificed, right? But, yeah, yeah, but they're that, really yeah. set up to be sacrificed. Right. And, and, and all the people in the world are like watching them, or this yeah. group is watching them and, um, and making bets on who's going to die, all this <laughs> stuff. And the, and the guy who, who uh, is smoking cannabis right from the beginning all the way through sees, like, starts to see through it hmm. because he isn't as easily... Uh, uh, tricked. He's not oh. as easily um, put into a hypnotic trance, sort oh, of a thing. Interesting. And um, so it's it's. <laughs> I know it's a, it's a Break out strange of the sort of a, smoke some cannabis. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. No, exactly it. And well, there's a joke yeah. about it, right? We all. Yeah. But if you have smoked cannabis, you know that experience. You sit back and you go, "Wait a minute." You know, you have it's, those kinds of experiences. It's true, all the yeah, time. like a kind of waking up experience. You're seeing things from a new perspective because it, we're going through life in our habitual mind, you know, day after day, same kind of thought patterns and emotions and situations, and then our <laughs> our consciousness has changed, mm-hmm. and so then everything is different. Mm-hmm. Even those same thoughts pop up, but you see them differently. You can relate to them differently. Right. You can have new insights. Now, if you're smoking weed all day, all the time, then that'll be your normal, and so maybe you need to stop. So in order to have and that breakout exactly. experience, exactly, <laughs> you know, because it's it's partly just a matter of, of shattering the habitual. There's this great article called the Consensus Trance. Do you know that? By mm-hmm. this guy Charles Tart, I think his name is, and he's basically saying that we're all walking around in a trance all the time, 
And um, so, like, to break the trance, like, something different needs to happen, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, and cannabis is great for that. Yeah, it can be, yeah. It, I mean, it can also send you into, like, this doubting reality. But, you yeah, know, so if, can, you, if you... It can be scary, but it can also to, just, like, make you go, wait a minute, I don't really want to do that, or... I think Why if you, I yeah, I mean, if you find yourself uh, getting in lots of like paranoia and fear and doubts, you got to ask yourself like, is this because of this plant, or is all this in me all the time already, and I'm just ignoring it? Like all the, you know, the fear of death, the fear of being judged, the fear of fucking up, all yeah. that stuff. Like that's that's human. We we actually have that all the time, and we try to push it to the side or ignore it. Or I'm not like that. But, like, we could all die at any moment, honestly. We're just these, like, fragile bags of skin walking around. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take much to puncture our, our fragile skin, you know. Yeah. And Psychologically so, or physically. Right, so you're just, yeah. like, ignoring a fear of death all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you get high and it just, like, starts to bubble up. And, well, that's the whole thing, I mean, from the perspective of therapy that, you know, we're talking about and the training is really about, it's basically saying... Um, we're working really hard to suppress what we're holding. Mm. Yeah. And, and it uses a lot of energy. We use a lot of energy to do it. Yeah. So, you know, psychedelics or meditation, things like that, um, which give us support, they also um, ease our defenses. Mm. And we feel safer. And then the stuff comes up. Right. So it's like... Yeah. Like, you need to feel safe in order to allow it to come up. Mm-hmm. You need yeah, to feel safe really enough. Yeah. So you're in, a, you're in a, a therapy and therapeutic environment with a therapist that you trust. Mm. And, you know, you're, you're using a drug that offers you um, not only access to yourself directly, but also eases that habitual mind. Mm. And it just naturally emerges. And usually what emerges is stuff that you, your, your subconscious is saying, uh, we need to let go of this. Mm. You know, so when we have that impulse um, to let go, like, I just really need to let go of this. When we have that sort of impulse, it's, it's accurate. We just don't know how. Mm. Yeah. We don't know how to let go. and We don't know how to process it. Right. Unless we, unless we learn. We can learn. Yeah, and we totally can. And it's basically a relearning because we used to know how, but we mm. have been kind of trained and conditioned to suppress yeah. it. So I think, you, yeah, something you just said that I think is so important is creating the safety, the context, the intention, and then the stuff can just, will naturally start to come up because it wants to come up because it wants mm-hmm. to come out. Mm-hmm. And maybe we've been avoiding it because it's going to feel like shit or it's going to feel scary or difficult, but we don't have to... If you set it up right, you actually don't have to go hunting for the thing that, you know, it'll just, it can, it's like this natural process that will happen on its own. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I think what you, what you just said is, is so true, too, that we, like, maybe as, um, I don't know, like, I think animals do it naturally. Mm-hmm. Robert Sapolsky talks about that, with like, zebras shaking. Mm-hmm. If they get chased by a lion and they escape, and then a little while later, they'll find a place and just shake, and then, like, release the trauma of almost having eaten and then escaped <laughs> this big stress that happened. Mm-hmm. And I think what's happened with humans is our, our thinking mind is so powerful, it's basically taken us over. So we're, we're captured by our thought process and our thinking mind and our past thoughts of the past and the future and the stories we're telling ourselves. And that's suppressing the, these kinds of natural processes that, that would otherwise happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and think about trauma. You know, something that really overwhelming happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and later on, it starts to come up. You know, it's not just I'm going to shake off a near miss in my car or something. It's like, mm. it's like really intense dread and mm. I feel like I'm going to die. You know, like a panic attack. Wow. Yeah. That's what that is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's trauma emerging mm. and, um, and wanting to release. And, and so we take, you know, we made... We go into it. And we think we're going to die. We end up in the hospital. We go to the ho- emergency room thinking that we're having a heart attack. We're, it's so believable, mm. but we're not. We're just releasing <sighs> so the, panic. <laughs> <laughs> so panic attack could be obviously connected with trauma that's wanting to come up. And would you? Do, would you? Maybe you could speak more to this. But would you say that sometimes, at least, the panic attack is being caught in the thoughts about it, like that? That like perpetuates the sense of fear and panic and. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, 
I think the thoughts, the, the, the getting caught in the thoughts is, is like some kind of attempt to manage it, uh-huh. maybe. I mean, I'm not saying this every time. I mean, I would have to yeah, like... Panic attacks are mysterious, right? Like, mm-hmm. They're hard to understand and explain. And, um, but I know that people who have gone through therapy like report no longer experiencing them or experiencing them much less often, or as it used to be a more regular thing, really disrupting their life. And obviously, they end up in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it's amazing because it's not coming from a present physical situation so much as like some kind of anxiety that's like boiling out of control. I don't know. I mean, because I'm trying to learn more about it myself. Well, this is something to think about because, you know, you're talking about animals shaking something off. Well, they, they shake it off as soon as they're out of danger. <clears throat> right. Um, so it's the lack of danger that allows things to mm. try to um, be let go of. So it's safety that actually brings up the most, you know, the, the deepest stuff. Mm. The more safety you gain in therapy, the more you clear from your system the more safe you feel in the relationship and you've healed relation, relationally. And now your therapist is somebody that you, you really trust. As that safety comes on board, um, you go deeper and you mm. release the harder stuff. Mm-hmm. It's almost like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm saying too much, but <laughs> uh, it's almost like some of the hardest pieces are done at the end. But, but they're balanced by a lot of goodness that emerges in the system mm. as well. But the reason I'm saying this is because um, one of the things that I think people run into, and when I was doing the consultations for the clinic, so I, I did all the consultations of the, of the people that were going to come and work with the therapist there. And I would do like this free one-hour consultation, and we just kind of go over their history and everything. And one of the things that I... Uh, pointed out to them because it usually came up somehow and what they were explaining they were suffering with was this idea that not an idea but it's kind of like the safety brings up the difficulty mm. so that's amazing I think that's a good good for people to hear that and know that so, yeah because we misinterpret yeah. it mm. and two it's sad it's sad that we misinterpret it because mm. it can wreak havoc on our lives for example <laughs> <laughs> um you are at you go to work every day and at work you're fine um and then you're driving home and as you get closer to your house and closer to your family closer to your dog you know that sort of a thing where you're going to be safe (coughs) the closer you get the um the more you start to feel anxious Mm. and by the time you get home you you know immediately have a glass of wine let's say just so you're responding to this rising anxiety on so your way home from work. You're managing it. And, yeah. mm-hmm. and, you know, and so you just drink some wine when you get home or, or whatever. But what you start to believe is that home is bad. Mm. I'm, I'm getting anxious the closer I get to home, so something's wrong. Mm. Something's wrong with me as a parent. Something's wrong with my relationship. Something's wrong, you know, et cetera. Yeah. And you're, so you're interpreting this anxiety that's coming up because you're heading toward safety and love as you must, something must be wrong there. Yeah. And that belief that there's something wrong is under a lot of anxiety. It's connected with the, a lot of the suffering that people have. A lot, a lot. And it, and it can really, they will question their relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, Similarly to like, if let's say you've decided that you want to really improve your health. Mm. You know, you want to lose weight, you want to improve your health, you want to get in shape. And so you just really put a lot of energy toward it. And and you are getting into shape and you are getting healthier and you are feeling much more confident and strong and all of this stuff, right? And you're super proud of yourself. Often what happens is at the point where you feel like you've gained resource Mm. or you've gained... Uh, trust in yourself, Mm -hmm. some of those gnarlier symptoms will come up. And people will have like this weird relapse into, um, you know, something will happen and they'll like start drinking again or they'll start eating again or they'll stop working out. And they have this huge 
sense of failure. Mm. Yeah. And it was the success that brought on the symptoms. Mm. It was because they had succeeded that they were able to feel things like old traumas again, and it mm. always happens. So and some those, old trauma comes up, right. yeah, and then they feel overwhelmed and defeated, and they misinterpret what just happened. They yeah. actually, they actually work their way towards that relapse. Wow, that's such a, a cool way to look at it. And so then the the behavior of like eating a bunch of not so good food or drinking is in response to the trauma that's finally coming up, mm-hmm. and that makes so much sense. And then yeah, but the what. Yeah, people tend to feel like a failure, judge themselves, and then, like, you know, feel like kind of give up hope or give up on something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they take it really hard. They take it really personally. Yeah. Well, I think our, our egos are, um, tend to, they want to be perfectionistic, and they want to, you know, either be the good guy or the bad guy or whatever. But, like, I've seen a lot of people, my, myself included, like, there's something like, I'm going to not drink for a month, say. I'm going to give up alcohol for a month. Or maybe they're going to give up alcohol forever. And then at some point they have like a drink. And then they this like avalanche of like self-blame and negativity and I'm a failure. And, and they're totally ignoring that like, okay, 30 days went by and you had one drink in 30 days. Like that's so much better than where you were the month before then. And yet it's hard to act, like feel good about that because you had set yourself up to, for this like perfect month and you failed. And, mm-hmm. and I think that some version of that happens a lot, right? Mm-hmm. We, we well, I mean, there's like how, how many b- billions then, <laughs> of a dollar industry yeah. is the is the self improvement. You know, like we spend so much money trying to be better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, <laughs> this is all, that's a big subject, but I think the mm-hmm. whole trying to improve ourselves and grow, like even though that's that's good and coming from a good place, it can so easily feed into self hatred. Mm-hmm. Because if I'm trying to get better, that means I'm not good where I'm at, and it just creates this kind of under the surface thing of like self hatred. Or like if I'm doing behavior A, B, C, then I'm I'm good. But then once I don't, then I'm bad again. And it's just like this. It's just not a good way to live. Like it's unnecessary. <laughs> it's not. It's like right. Uh huh. It's not um, the best way to. I don't know. I'm getting to a place where I'm pretty. <laughs> skeptical and cynical of the whole self-help self-growth thing i mean even though like i think growth is a natural process Mm -hmm. but you don't become like a better human being through growing into a better human being like it's like we're already a good human being it's like like if we had a tree outside and it was like a five-year-old tree and it's kind of small it's still a tree it doesn't become like a better tree when it's 100 years old and it doesn't spend 100 years, like, evaluating and judging itself. <laughs> it's just doing what trees do, which is just growing. But it's not, like, it's not growth from this, like, egoic game of, like, of judging, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know exactly how to, like, launch into that, <laughs> that conversation, but it's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, and, and this, is, this is where, you know, we have... The mental health system, I mean, I was seeing, we didn't advertise our clinic. We were just kind of like, kind of flying under the radar for a while. Because what we were doing was, um, we were trying to set a precedent. Well, we were trying to set a precedent because cannabis isn't considered a therapeutic substance. Yeah. I mean, there people were looking at it medically, right. but not therapeutically. Right, no, you're right, yeah. And so if, if, it was great it, territory. It's, it's like the opposite of that. Right, like, exactly. Almost, like yeah. So most therapists are, you know, are, are told that, you know, if your client comes in high, you have to send them home. Right. You know? Or drunk or whatever, yeah. Right, yeah. right. And um, so we were kind of doing the opposite, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we flew under the radar <laughs> for a while. And, um, and we weren't advertising so that means that the people that came to us, and we had a steady flow of clients, mm. were people that were looking for us. It was like pe- there were there are many people out there that you know have trauma, have PTSD, uh, other dissociative mm-hmm. types of uh, diagnoses, and they're and they are keeping their eye on this psychedelic thing mm-hmm. because they have tried everything. Mm. You know, they've tried 
behavioralism. They've tried talk therapy. They've tried, you know, um, pharmaceuticals, every Mm -hmm. one of them. They've tried EMDR. They've tried somatic experiencing even, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, And their only hope, you know, they're, they're like running out of options. Right. So they're keeping a very close eye on what is going on in the psychedelic world. You know, they're watching maps really closely. Mm-hmm. So when we were on the web and we could be found, they found us. So, what, and I'm saying that to say that we would get people into the clinic, in the, especially that first year, who, um, you know, had, were very sophisticated in their experience with therapy mm-hmm. and, their, um, and they're looking for solutions. Like people who have been working on themselves and going to therapy for years and... Yeah. The issues are still there. The trauma still feels like it's there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a sad fact of our our world. I think there's more people than we realize out there like that. Well, yeah, yeah. and if and if um, what has happened and what they would tell me is basically they would tell me these stories about how I failed the MDR. Mm, that's the interpretation as a failure again. Mm-hmm. The self blame. And the- I failed. I failed therapy. <clears throat> you know, I. Um, you know, I was in therapy, but then this big rage came out, and my therapist fired me. Oh, you like heard that. stuff like that? Oh, oh yeah, oh. from, like, everybody. And um, <laughs> but what they had internalized in, like, 20 years of getting therapy was that therapy had failed them. Mm. Or No, 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 that was me. Uh-huh. That was my interpretation. They had failed therapy. That they had failed therapy, that they were a failure, yeah. That's, that's sad to hear that. When in reality, mm. we are... We are approaching therapy the same way we kind of approach self-help mm. um, in a way that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but tr- <laughs> we keep trying. It's like <laughs> or maybe, maybe to make, you know, it, it helps some people some of the time, but maybe not everyone. Yeah. It helps you manage, you yeah. know, but you're, but well, so like you, you, see- you were pointing to, you, you stopped drinking for a month you know, and maybe you will always continue to stop drinking. Maybe you'll pull that off, and that's awesome. Yeah. Um, but every time you relapse or mm-hmm. whatever, um, it's because another part of you that wants to drink won, mm-hmm. and you haven't suppressed it mm-hmm. enough. Right. So, the, the, yeah, the question or is, tactically. How, how do we get to a place where these parts aren't in conflict with each other anymore? And to me, that's... Such a big, fascinating question that, you know, I'm working on myself. Like, how do I do that? Because I right. see all these inner conflicts in myself, too, all the time. I'm not there or wherever there is. But I think if there is some kind of relapse or some kind of uh, thing like that where, you you know, I'm not going to eat ice cream again forever and then you eat it, 10 pints of ice cream in one night or whatever it is, <laughs> that's an opportunity to, like, if you can see your therapist, if you have a good therapist, but at least on your own, that's an opportunity to, like, watch the self-blame and the self-judgment and potentially heal that because that's the part that that really Mm -hmm. needs healing right that is the biggest part that needs healing it's like we're subconsciously at war with ourselves Mm -hmm. yeah and um like how do you be like the tree well the (laughs) tree is subconsciously at war with themselves (laughs) yeah we're so it's so fascinating that human beings can be so internally divided and at war with ourselves and somehow the positive messages we get reinforce that inner conflict at times like be the best version of yourself okay well that means i'm not the best version of myself right now and i have to get there then there's this divide and here's the best <laughs> version of myself here's the worst right, then there's a wor- <laughs> if there's a best version there must be a worse version then <laughs> it's so tricky to talk about because of course we want to be good people of course we want to improve and grow so i think it's possible to do that from a place where somehow that growth has to include Healing, letting go of the self blame and self negativity. You know, if your if your growth process or development path is increasing your self negativity, then it's not a good one. I'm gonna say something like that, right? Put that out there. I know, but then you're like, it's not good for me to be so so. Negative. <laughs> <You're> no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then you just have to smoke a lot of cannabis. <laughs> or this is, I think, this is actually where Buddhism comes in. And other spiritual that's a, that's, traditions. That's a good point. Almost they all kind of make you, the same point. Yeah, almost any message you get could become fuel for the self-negativity, mm-hmm. which seems like 
sometimes it seems to me like the number one epidemic of our time, of our culture of 2022, whatever time you, I mean, it's probably not going to change in a few years, mm-hmm. <laughs> is, is the self-directed criticism and negativity and blame. It's just huge, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And in the, in the psychedelic community, I, I find this to be ironic, <laughs> that, um, that there's this, like, there's this almost like a clinging to an, an ego structure of, you know, uh, ident- that, like, you know, like clinging to different identities that, um, that make, that define you as good, mm. you know, like, um, it's almost like we become more clinging to how we identify as good. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, have these, these epiphanies of egolessness mm. and think that that is what you want to achieve. Yeah. And it's a, it's, it's an irony, <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, I think it comes back around to like, um, the, that, suppression piece and the mm. management piece because of course it's like the it, it's the things that you feel bad about that you are suppressing not just the things you're scared of but i mean you're scared of that too mm. i mean you're scared of being bad mm. you know yeah. so you're suppressing what's bad and you're suppressing what you're afraid of and 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 the what we have realized and mm. and what the somatic what somatic work is is kind of getting to but i i think it i think it goes beyond just that animal nervous system level mm-hmm. um but that when we allow things to come uh into awareness and feel them you know like an embodied yeah. awareness mm-hmm. um they they process themselves mm. I mean, it's good to have somebody with you that knows how to interpret it mm-hmm. as your guide, but it's like, um, but in a, in a way, it's just, it will heal itself. I love that. Yeah. And that's the whole, the name, innate path, the name of your organization. That's that where it comes this from. This innate healing that it can happen, mm-hmm. in, you know, from within. Mm-hmm. And that it's a natural process and that, yeah, I love that. <laughs> Yeah, on so many levels, we have yeah. these innate healers. Just like we assume if we cut ourselves that it's going to mm. heal. Right. You know, we assume that, but we don't assume that we're not going to heal emotionally from some um, huge grief. It's mm. a great point. Yeah. And that, well, so part of, part of that process is, uh, is one of trust. That when we're in a traumatized state, we've lost, you know, trust in the world and other people and ourselves and the healing process to... Build, you know, you're, you're regaining trust in the world. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be constantly on guard against danger. You don't have to um, be constantly watching yourself so you don't mess up or whatever it is. And I think that's an important part of the healing process. And then that, that can include making mistakes. Like you can start to access a deeper level of trust of just everything, reality itself. And um, that doesn't mean that everything's going to work out perfectly all the time. It means that you'll fuck up. Other people will fuck up. Mistakes will be made. Messes will be made but it can be like held in this bigger context of like overall trust, you know, and that, that innate healing can happen. The, the, somehow trusting the innate processes to happen, to do what they need to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause I think, I think what some of what you're speaking to of, we are suppressing things all the time. And there's a fear there that if you stop suppressing those things, whatever they are for you, all hell's going to break loose. Like I can't ever touch a drop of alcohol again, because if I do all hell's going to break loose. And for some people, maybe that's true. And that's good for them to be fully sober, but, for some people, you know, after some period of sobriety, they actually discover, oh, I can't have a drink, and the world doesn't end. And so it's like, there's there's just many things like that, whatever it is for you. Mm-hmm. Well, the yeah. thing about the drinking, let's say, you know, I'm aware that if I drink, all hell's going to break loose, but all hell's breaking loose because I have an even deeper thing that I need to resolve. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You know, the, That's a more symptom. Of, it's yeah. A yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. If you... As you start to, the, the neat thing about, I think about the therapy that we practice is 
as you start to experience the smaller things, um, being trustable, mm. a little shame here, some a shot of fear here, mm-hmm. some panic here, and then like, um, you know, like this aspect of yourself that you never told anybody sort mm. of a thing, right? Yeah. It starts to gradually build. That's, and, a, that's a good example. Something about yourself that you've never told someone and there's fear if you do and how healing and empowering it can be if you, when you reach a point where you can share that and, like, yeah. and not be, hopefully, not be judged and rejected. And, yeah. yeah, and it's just like you keep testing it. It's yeah. like, okay, if this works, then let's, let's allow this to come up. Yeah. And, um, and part of that's conscious a lot of it's subconscious. Like your subconscious is so smart. Mm. It, it, is, it orchestrates mm. all of this to your benefit. Mm. Even if it's painful, even if life is painful, it's actually doing what it's doing to um, protect you, mm-hmm. um, which is a really interesting concept. But as you start to let the stuff come up and process it, Mm. you start to trust that it's going to work out. Mm. Like it's, it's coming up and because it's like, it comes up and you're like, Oh, that's why I was so afraid. That makes sense. Oh, that's about a memory when I was five, you know, and Mm. I thought it was about now Mm. and it's not. Um, And then you're like, yeah, I was really alone. It's like you start to not only um, understand what it is you're holding, um, see that it can be resolved by with that allowing it to come up instead of keeping mm. it down. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then you grow comp- not only trust for all of that, you start to see the intelligence of the whole thing. So oh. then you're building like this deeper trust in yourself, and and you build compassion for yourself because mm. you start to get that. The things that happened the way they did um, happened because you were under tremendous pressure or Mm. because somebody really betrayed you or, Mm. you know, something like that. So So to understand it, yeah, Mm -hmm. almost always, like, you're everyone, we're doing the best that we can in every moment, you know. Then, like, later maybe we judge it or think it's wrong or whatever, but... We have no idea. Like, it's, it's like we have no idea how brilliant how brilliantly we are doing in every moment. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, yeah. It, we are under incredible amounts of pressure for human beings right now. Yeah. And we have, like, intergenerational stuff that just keeps coming down epigenetically and, mm-hmm. and in family systems. And then we've got systemic traumas. And we've got, we've got a lot on our plate. And, um, and we beat the crap out of ourselves mm. around it. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, this is this is why psychedelics are here <laughs> to show us the way back, mm. and um, and I think it's we're gonna have to do some negotiating for a while, but <laughs> but um, but what they really do is it's like our subconscious is psychedelic, and um, mm. so the psychedelics just kind of help us re reimagine ourselves or. Yeah. see ourselves for how we actually are and then you know mm. over time we're going to start pulling ourselves out of this yeah it's beautiful it's like i think that's true like if they're used if the psychedelics are used in the right way in the right sun setting and i think that's what we're kind of discovering as a culture mm-hmm. that's what you're doing mm-hmm. and sharing with people and then this this beautiful process of someone coming to you for therapy staying with you for however many sessions it takes but then learning how to process more on their own you know so they become once you start to awaken to that oh, inner yeah. healing process, then you're not like, and I think, you know, then I was going to say, then you're healing yourself. You're able to process and you're able to go through life without hopefully building up, letting the trauma build up in your system. Mm-hmm. And um, I think part of psychedelics, part of why they've been made illegal in the past and suppressed and are taboo is they have a uh, this capacity of like empowerment. Exactly. Of, of you learning the truth yourself, of you learning how to heal yourself, of you figuring shit out yourself. And mm-hmm. that's, that's like, really exciting to think about mm-hmm. it doesn't need to be like let's make a new corporation and like market some new thing but it's like what i'm excited about is like how can we all start to become more access this inner healing and healing healers within right yeah 
I mean, if, what if we didn't think we were bad? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I mean, a lot yeah. of people would go out of business. <laughs> a lot of what industries would disappear. What if we didn't think we were bad? Yeah, that really struck me. That's like that's some huge message that we get imprinted with, right, or conditioned by. For many uh, decades. Geez. I don't know how long this has been going. Yeah. yeah. What if we didn't think we were bad? <laughs> and I wonder if, you know, how much of the really bad stuff that does happen is a result of the suppression of the trauma from the past, of all the, all the causes and conditions that go into it. Like, why was that guy the way he was? Well, okay. chances are he was abused himself, right? A ton of it. Yeah. A ton of it. And even think about this. People who aren't going around purposefully hurting people, but we, we hurt people inadvertently. A lot of times when we end up hurting people, it's because we, we've been trying to protect them. Wow. <laughs> think of, I oh, mean, think are. about Heritage it. For, out there. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, it's so okay. crazy. I've been there. I've done that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're, yeah. you're trying, you're holding something that you feel is um, scary, explosive, um, dangerous. You're holding it from your childhood. Something, you know, that came out of your childhood, some sort of abuse or neglect or something like that, you know, which is very, very common. And you don't want that to come out toward your partner. You don't want that to come out toward your kids, your friends. So you manage it like a champ. Mm. You are trying to protect them. That is your intention. Mm. Yeah. But, you know, it's, you can't, it's like that, I use the metaphor of like a beach ball that you um, push under the pool and you sit on uh, and it's like <laughs> slippery yeah. and you're like sitting there going like this and you're managing it and, and then like, it there's, slips. There's no, there's no beach ball here. <laughs> right? It slips out and you, have you ever seen that how the balls, they go like yeah. boom, boom and then they <laughs> pop out of the water and they smack somebody really hard in the head, yeah. give them a bloody nose or something. That's how it, huh. that's how it often goes down. Well. We just, we get stressed out, some sort of overwhelm happens, we can't manage, and we just like lash out because of the pressure of the suppression. Mm -hmm. And in reality, all we were doing was really trying to protect them from it. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's well said. (laughs) You know, and then we, uh, you know, we end up in anger management or, you know. (laughs) The other thing about trauma that I've been thinking about and noticing more is, is that it's not resolved, if it's not processed, if it's not felt and released, and somehow have some kind of process with it, it builds up in our system. And so I've seen some clients lately who, like, their life was fine. They're in their 40s or 50s, and then this little thing happened that they thought was little, and then all of a sudden they're having, like, a breakdown. And but the reality is when we dig under the surface and spend some time with them, like, all this stuff had built up for years, mm-hmm. right? And so, yeah. and then, bam. Mm-hmm. And then, oh, you have full-blown PTSD, it didn't actually just happen from that one thing, right? No, they've had it the whole time. And if you, like, look back... <laughs> <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, there's a trajectory of PTSD, a common trajectory, and one of them is, like, you spend a couple of decades, like, managing it. And you build mm. a whole identity around that management. Wow. Often you go to school to help you manage it. It's like, uh, it's like people that go become doctors right. or, you know, or, or therapists or, you know, they're, they're going to study something that's going to actually help them resolve it someday. That's the intelligence Mm. of the subconscious. Mm. It's saying, we don't have the resources we need. We don't know enough to to solve this. So go to school and find out. And then we'll just manage it. We'll just keep it all, you know. And then, uh, but decades go by and, you know, you are running on adrenaline and you're... Yeah, the... the long-term cost of the of managing it yeah it's not sustainable mm-hmm. Whew, i had so many uh things i was going to ask you about <laughs> one of them was um you mentioned i think with the vets like using touch as part of the therapy process i think in my ideal world that would be more common and that when people came in person to therapy that would be a more normalized part of it but uh, in our world in reality that's that's pretty taboo and pretty rare and um i don't know do you want to speak to that because it's such a it's such mm-hmm. a thing to like yeah touch to be touched. Um, yeah, the I mean, for one, when you're doing work with trauma, um, 
you just don't want people to be in there alone. Hmm. I mean, you just... So the touch is like letting someone know, I'm here with you. Yeah. In a very physical way. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I mean, sense. that's just, that's one aspect of it. If you're going through something, like for example, you're moving through something and you got to imagine, you know, clients have eye shades on usually and and it's all, you know, it's somatic, it's emotional, it's memory, you know, and you're going through, let's say, a little kid who is, you know, getting spanked every night so they are, you know, hiding under the covers. Hmm. Well, when you're processing that, you feel the fear of a little kid. Hmm. Well, what therapist can sit there with a little kid? Because effectively that's what's happening. Hmm. And and let them be alone. You can't let them be alone. Hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're gonna you're gonna, you know, with uh, you know, with consent, which is Super easy. You just say, mm-hmm. um, you want some contact. Mm-hmm. Now, usually when people are in a scared place, they'll say, yeah. And you just come in and you and you do that thing. You put your, you know, what would you do if it was your kid? You'd, mm-hmm. you'd put your hand on their back. You'd, you'd hold their hands. You'd move in close, mm-hmm. you know, sort of a thing. Yeah. So that's one thing. That's one aspect of it. But there's another aspect of it, which is that it brings up relationship. And a lot of people don't, you know, there's a lot of people, I'm sure you know them, and they're, uh, they're not huggers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, cool, cool, it's, uh, I love you and all, but don't touch me. Yeah. You know, sort of thing. And um, so they have a relational wound. Mm. You know, if you track it, it's usually parental. Mm. You know, it's fundamental. So in therapy, when you're working on relational wounds, uh, the parent is the original intimacy. Mm. You know, you yeah. You know, they take care of you in a very intimate way. Breastfeeding, all of that. You know, it's a very intimate mm-hmm. um, relationship, and so um, that's our map of intimacy. <clears throat> so you know, the as a therapist. You can, people can be in places that are, you know, may have relational aspects, let's say, to their mom. Mm-hmm. And you say something like, um, you know, would, would you like to try touch? You talk, you talk to them about it at length prior to this. And they'll be like, yeah, I'm curious. And so you put your hand, let's say, on their arm mm. and see what happens. Often what will happen before it's healed, and this is how you kind of can gauge whether those pieces of relationship are healing, because originally you, you put your hand on their arm and, and, they'll, and they'll pull away from you, you know, turn away, or they'll not want to look at you, and it's all part of what they're processing. And you're, you just, you go with it, because you want to process that, don't touch me. And do you keep your hand on mm-hmm. them? Yeah. I mean, of course I say, is it okay if I keep my hand on you? And they're like, yeah, because we know what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. You're Uh, allowing that turning away and that mm -hmm. maybe feeling of wanting to run away or disgust or whatever comes up. Yeah, Yeah, and often transference will come up from it. That's powerful. Um, Which is like that projected relationship. Right. So they'll they'll think I'm their mom. (laughs) I I, But not, yeah, but it's like... You negotiate these things well ahead of time so that you can talk about it. And usually it's a very curious process. Mm. Yeah. Transference is that's an interesting one, right? It's so famous, mm. but it's, it's tricky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So many topics. <laughs> well, the, <laughs> I'm like, hey, let's launch into that now. <laughs> Another topic I want to ask so about was uh, disassociation, which is huge. It's a huge thing. Big topic. Mm-hmm. In, in the context of psychedelics, that any kind of substance use could be pretty much, I think, could be used towards disassociation or mm-hmm. become a disassociative experience. It seems like, you know, can, a lot of people, when they drink, for example, or smoke cannabis or whatever mm-hmm. it is, are in some kind of disassociative state. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe not always, but how do you work with that? Yeah, I mean, because it's like, it's a tricky thing to, you might not be aware that it's happening from your subjective point of view, like when you're in it. During therapy? 
Like, or just, how do I frame I'm it? Just speaking in general, like if I was disassociated, I may not notice in the moment. Like that's kind of part of the definition of it, right? That's so, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you notice it as a therapist, but yeah, how would you? Well, uh, you know, and, and maybe remember this from the training, but um, one of the things as a therapist you're doing, in my opinion, one of the, the big roles you can play is identifying dissociation. Mm-hmm. You know, you're looking for it. The, you know, clients can't can't see it. It's our blind spots. Right. Yeah. So you've been there, noticing it and naming mm-hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. And and it's just like anything else. It's not. It's not different. Mm-hmm. So like, if you were, um, if you if I noticed that you were um, dissociating somehow, and I just said, oh, you know, are you? Do you feel like you're here in the in the room with me, or? Mm. Um, what are you noticing? And you might say something like, I feel like I'm not really in my body. Mm-hmm. Something like that. That's yeah. a dissociation. And I said, well, tell me more. Where do you feel like you are? Mm. And, and you might say something like, well, I'm kind of above and above my body and up. And then, um, well, what, what can you notice about that? Well, I kind of feel like I'm floating. Okay. Really notice that. Notice the sensation of floating. So yeah. all it's the, it's the embodied awareness sort of thing. You're just, mm-hmm. you're just, because dissociation is what happens when we're, we're in a situation that overwhelms us. Mm. Yeah. Do you think there's, I mean, there's a certain level of disassociation that maybe is normal and even healthy or helpful? Like, I think, I'm just thinking about, like, the mindfulness movement and, you know, be present and, um, or even be in your body. And it may be that it's not realistic or helpful to try to do something like that all the time, for example. That there's, like, like daydreaming or <laughs> watching Netflix. Like, it's a part of being a normal human being to occasionally disassociate. Obviously, it can become problematic if it's happening too much. Is it, bad? Know, is, it, is it bad? Maybe that's what I'm asking. Like, because uh, I don't think it is bad. I guess that's part of what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is. It is what it is. It's like. Um, but I'm saying it's not always maybe covering up some thing that you don't want to look at or. Um. Oh. Oh. I see what you're saying. Uh, so. Just like, but you're just saying kind of like just mindlessness. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Like a mild dissociation. Yeah. Where you're just not really present. You're just checking out and yeah. um, watching some TV and, re- and relaxing. I guess my, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I guess my question is coming partly from being on like, you know, meditation retreats or in kind of spiritual communities where there's like this trying to be present all the time. And I get that being present is good, you know, in general, but it can become another. I think it can actually become a kind of extreme, maybe. Mm-hmm. And then you're managing your presence. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I mm-hmm. guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, which I mean, you do from time to time. I'm managing my presence right here. I'm making sure I'm present. Right. You know, but um, but if I were to try to be present all the time because I thought it was the good thing to do and it made me a better meditator <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, this is a trap you get into. Yeah. Yeah. Better, in my opinion, um, to just notice when you notice, right? The first thing mm-hmm. in meditation instruction is the noticing. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, I mean, outside of the posture and everything, and the, the basic um, instruction, you're, you're told to notice when you're not present. Yeah. And you go, you know, in the, the type of meditation that I was taught, you you say gently to yourself um thinking right yeah and then you bring bring yourself back to the present moment such a subtle thing Mm -hmm. because once you notice you're already present basically exactly (laughs) exactly it's like it's like that joke of like go do mindlessness practice (laughs) i don't know if you ever were told to do that as part of your study but it's hilarious because you can't So part of the process you're naming, if you're there and the client's disassociating and you're helping them notice it, 
then they're learning how that happens. Like that whole process kind of happens. Maybe why it happens. Maybe what's there. Yeah. yeah. And in the process of um, starting to see it, it's being pulled out of that blind spot. Um, they're also resolving it. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, so this leads to the other big thing I want to ask you about, which is one of the most fascinating things of the training that I did with, with you guys. Um, and I think it's pretty unique to innate path, but it was, an emphasis on noticing your management strategies to use that language, but then not doing them <laughs> if you can, or at least name, you know, like for example, for me, like I'll take a deep breath often and that'll help me to kind of regulate myself, maybe to come back to being present. And so when I, I did a session with um, an innate path trained therapist and she noticed me doing that, she's like, notice that impulse and see if you can uh, just be with it without doing it again. Mm-hmm. And that was like, oh, wow, because I wasn't even fully consciously aware that I was doing it because it's so automatic to me. Mm-hmm. But then we have these kinds of um, strategies that we've learned, often healthy and good ones, to manage, to regulate, to be present. But that in the context of therapy, if you can not do that, there's more of an opportunity to get to the underlying thing that you're doing it for. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I so basically, that, yeah. I mean, the idea, and this goes back to before the clinic, this was that original somatic training that um, I uh, took and then and was training in when I was talking back about MAPS, um, which my former partner has uh, trains in this very technical, um, te- the te- a very technical piece of work around um, managing, uh, reducing your management strategies. Because Mm. basically the idea is that we're always trying to heal. I mean, we're always, any opportunity we get, the stuff's gonna come up because that's our our instinct. So Mm -hmm. any safety we find, any, um, you know, any bush to shake under, you know, sort of thing, it'll just start to emerge. And we're just constantly kind of keeping it, you know, like Mm -hmm. this. And we do it in a lot of different ways. Like you were saying, like taking a deep breath, that's really common. Mm -hmm. So, so when, um, uh, so when you're laying there and you're focusing on body and something starts to arise that feels like, let's say anxiety Mm -hmm. in your chest often, right? And you just have this natural habit of taking a deep breath and releasing it. Mm -hmm. And then you're kind of back, back to square one. If you don't release it, and instead, you turn your attention toward it, mm. it'll get bigger. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. going to, you're giving it permission and, um, and you're not, you're not easing it. Right. right. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. And then you're like, really? You, <laughs> I, it's okay for my anxiety to get bigger? Yeah. <laughs> it's counterintuitive and it might be hard if someone's just listening or watching this to you know, unless you experience it, because there's, I think there's these, like, things that we do all the time to, like, yeah, manage ourselves. And mm-hmm. What happens when you don't do them? And it's helpful to have the, the therapist there to, like, notice them, mm-hmm. you know, help you notice them. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you got home, on your way home from work, you're getting more and more anxious, and you don't have that glass of wine. Mm-hmm. That's right. it. That's exactly That's the, it. Same the same sort thing. of yeah. um, thing. Mm-hmm. Then you're going to be anxious all night, and it's probably going to intensify. Mm. <laughs> Unless you can, you know, maybe get below the surface of it. or Yeah, or unless you have a really good meditation practice. <laughs> I, I mean, that's what I used my meditation practice for, uh, was to calm everything down, calm everything down. Anytime something came up that was hard for me to deal with, I'd just meditate more. Mm. Um, until I started doing this work. And so, the, yeah, doing this work shifted your relationship with meditation, it sounds like. Yeah, it shifted it a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. At first it shifted it. And every time I tried to meditate, I would go into like processing. Mm. And then it shifted to, (laughs) why am I meditating? This is the way to go. This is what has to be done. This is where it's at. So I just stopped meditating for a long time. And then, um, but then uh, it actually became more and more obvious as the clinic, as Mm. we were, we had so many therapists, we had so many clients and we were just growing and learning a lot. And um, I started to realize how how much my training in Buddhism and meditation applied to this um, in terms of how the Buddhists 
and, and others. But that was my training. How the Buddhists really, really got how the buying worked. Mm. So, you know, when you're looking for just body releases, that's one thing. But when, you, when the mind starts to become a phenomenon unto itself mm. that has to find its healing path, then you want to know the actual, um, how does the mind work? What is consciousness? And, um, and, and how can we hold it therapeutically so that it can heal? Because in trauma, it's not just that you have, it hurts your relationship to yourself, it hurts your relationship to others, it stores mm-hmm. nervous system charge in your body, it stores emotions, mm-hmm. it gets linked to a bunch of other things, but it also has this consciousness component. Yeah. And often early childhood trauma will cause the consciousness to split. Mm. And you'll have parts. And this is where like parts work mm-hmm. um, kind of points to, you know, those, um, <clears throat> they call them exiled parts. Mm. Parts of our self mm-hmm. personality. Yeah. The parts of ourselves that we don't, um, we disown. Mm. And so we need to under, I mean, when, it, when they come up in therapy, they can come up in really interesting ways. And mm. there can also be other phenomenon, mental phenomenon that emerge that um, Buddhism is like, is like, yeah. in, from my opinion at this point, the source mm. of, so good at of like, um, knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's that, brilliant. I mean, that's what they that's what they did. Yeah. You know, they got to the kind of fundamental natural consciousness that the more you access is, has that like self-healing, self maybe self-cleansing even, I don't know, whatever metaphor you want to use, but Yeah, and uh, they self-cleansing quality. Yeah. yeah, and they're all about like you you know, you can't have a goal. You there right. there's no goal. Um or they're working with um undoing that inner conflict mm-hmm. and how to hold it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's other mental phenomenon like projection. So like if I'm not owning some aspect of myself, like that's bad, I'm not bad, I'm mm-hmm. the good me. Mm-hmm. And so the bad me, um, I, you know, I disown. Right. When we do that, we still have to relate to it. So we put it, and we give it to other people to hold for us. Uh. <laughs> so, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you be bad, so I can relate to myself. Well, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and Buddhism really talks about that kind of stuff too. Yeah, that's... like kind of projection or kind of enrolling other people in your own stuff, and then people kind of click in those ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, like, like the world. Uh, it's like a. It's a reflection of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, gosh, well, maybe an example would be like, all men are bad, and now you're another man that I connect with, and now you're bad too. And, yeah. And not looking at, like, at yourself. Like, at yourself. How are you in engagement with the world where all men have seen bad to you? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and really what it, that kind of thing boils down to is um, you're not facing your own inner perpetrator. Mm. Oh. And that's a hard one to face. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is. And it comes last on the... On it the, comes last. Okay, good. <laughs> in therapy. <laughs> that's interesting. That's a hard one to face, a hard one to trust, right? It sounds weird even to say that, but ultimately... Yeah. You want to be able to trust all these parts of yourselves to not... Well, what's the... To not enact harm in the world. And, you know. Right. What's the wisdom of the perpetrator? Mm. Putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, I mean, like, what? What well, is? There's a desire for connection, mm-hmm. even if it's coming out in a, in a bad, even terrible way. Well, I mean, think about it, like um, predator. Mm. What's the wisdom of the predator? <sighs> to get, you know, to be fed. Yeah. Yeah. To provide for themselves and their family. On some level. Uh-huh. To provide, yeah. To protect. Uh, yeah, protection. So, it's like it's you know. Twisted, it's, but it's been twisted somehow. If it's showing up as a perpetrator. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. It's bad. It's bad. You know. And so, 
once the the resolve resolving the badness around it we get our perpetrator back Mm. and we are able to then protect ourselves and protect the people that we love Mm. you know instead of feeling ineffective or powerless Mm. yeah and um you know and we can get what we need Mm. it's kind of a thing yeah. So there's that's a powerful. lot of wisdom that's getting suppressed when we reject our own perpetrator. Mm-hmm. A lot of wisdom, a lot of power. A lot of power, yeah. yeah. Energy. Mm-hmm. A lot of wholesomeness, honestly. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. I, it's, I know it's counterintuitive. It's wild to say that, yeah. yeah. It makes sense to me. I think that's, I think that's awesome to, to share that because usually in the media and in the news and whatever, we never get that kind of possibility. It's not even on the... You know, it's hard to even conceive of that, um, you know, that it could, that part that's a perpetrator that causes harm could actually, in essence, if it was healed and like came out in a good way, could be providing protection, could be getting your needs met, could be, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. have energy and power and purpose. And, yeah. yeah, that's why, you know, it's good to sit around and smoke weed sometimes <laughs> and just go, what? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Hmm. So you when did innate path start? I should ask you this at the beginning, but uh, it started in um, the beginning of two thousand eighteen. Okay, but it's been a real like front runner in this whole psychedelic assisted therapy movement. So it's yeah, amazing. yeah, yeah. We, we I think we might have been like one of the first clinics in the country. Wow, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was neat. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I hope this conversation, at least in part, hopefully it'll provide a lot of things, but maybe one thing that it could change some of the attitudes towards cannabis, that it could be an agent of healing, that it could be used therapeutically. Um, that would be wonderful because it is so accessible. So accessible. It's so safe. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we should, could shed some of the stigmas around it and learn new ways because it's really like learning a new skill, a new process, a new relationship. And if you've used it habitually in the past, that you know, it could feel very different or weird or, Right. It's like, um, let's say yeah. it's a, it's like your best friend. Mm. And I think it is to a lot of people. It is to a lot of people. Because, yeah. and, I, and I can say, you know, I used to have PTSD. That's where <clears throat> resolving it I, is where my knowledge base comes from outside of my Buddhist studies and my somatic therapy yeah. studies or whatever. My own experience is actually the foundation of my knowledge. I'm watching all my clients and stuff. But I used to have a relationship with cannabis where it was like my best friend. I would smoke cannabis, drink a glass of wine, like, every night after my daughter went to bed, and I would just sit there and, like, hang out with myself. Mm. And I was entertained. But it was like... (laughs) But it was like... It was like a friend. Because it would allow me to interact with my own mind in a way. Right, you're being with yourself, yeah. Like, being with myself in a way that I found entertaining. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, I think a lot of people have that relationship to it. And, um, and... and they feel like they should give it up. But really, you could just change your relationship to it. And then all of a sudden, that friendship is just really paying off for you. Awesome, yeah. It's an empowering message to mm-hmm. share. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. And I think, I think bringing it into therapy, like experiencing cannabis-assisted therapy could be a, a great way to like change that relationship. Or like, I mean, it's just it's so powerful and so unexpected mm-hmm. um, and so surprising. I'm just speaking from my own experience. Like totally. when my first experience, I was like, "Wow, I didn't understand the potential and power here." Right. It's I didn't either. I had no yeah. idea until my, <laughs> my client, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, that is more intense than MDMA." <laughs> 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 well, she, I had, a, I had a client, the first one, and she would do really high doses, um, mm-hmm. but her husband picked her up. Um, yeah, I my, one of my one of my uh, one of the projects that I'd really like to do is talk about cannabis and talk about how to change your relationship to cannabis at yeah. home. You, not even taking it to a therapist, but mm. just like that that friendship that you have, that relationship that you have with it. Start to look look for this, try this, mm. do this, and see and change your relationship to it so that you can actually resolve. Um, mm 
some conflicts, resolve anxiety, resolve fears, um, just with cannabis at home. Cool. How would you advise someone to do that if they if they want to try it out? Um, well, that's what I, I I would I would like I would love to. Um, which is why I was talking to you about <laughs> help me maybe do a podcast for the site because <laughs> I think we'd it would have to be talked about at length. You know, it's like just a like, teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a teaching yeah. on cannabis. And then, and then, of course, you know, there's certain things that you run into that Mm -hmm. you want to go get a therapist to help you with. Sure, yeah. I think, like, to simplify it, like, if you set aside some amount of time where you don't have anything else you need to do, and Mm -hmm. then you can take in some amount of cannabis, whether an edible or smoking, and then just be with your own experience without distracting yourself. Mm -hmm. Try not to judge it. And try not to judge it and stay with yourself, stay with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that would, uh open up a lot of doors, so that would take, you know, that would be a big part of the process. Mm-hmm. Like you're set, kind of setting up a set and setting in a context. Mm-hmm. Wasn't um, cannabis used in uh, meditation? And I mean, it was, wasn't big <clears throat> in India and it's meditation? Definitely, yeah, it's definitely in India, and it's mm-hmm. been discovered, which is fascinating, in some ancient tombs. It was probably part of burial rites in, in mm-hmm. ancient Israel and ancient India. It's controversial, though, but it's, it's sacred to Lord Shiva, for sure. And there's a day of celebrating Shiva in India and Nepal, and everyone, not everyone, but many people go out in the street and smoke a little bit of hashish or cannabis, whatever they have, and mm-hmm. celebrate Shiva. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, like, the history is so long and convoluted and different religious sects and different opinions, so it's, it's pretty taboo, actually. I mean, a lot of meditation communities, cannabis is, is not considered good because it's thought to be disassociated, basically. But is it historical? Yeah. Some people believe, I've read some scholars that the historical Buddha Shakyamuni in the 5th century BC, like that may have been on the menu, so to speak, for yogis and meditators um, as an aid in their meditation. So it's possible that, it's totally possible that the actual historical Buddha, you know, that was one of the things he did, but there's, there's no historical record of it in the Buddhist tradition. Um, but for sure, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is, there is historical precedent there, and I, I would like, like to see Buddha it. Buddha like smoked the, weed. Jesus was a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> Santa Claus well, was a shaman. <laughs> the idea that the historical Buddha did smoke Just hashish and cannabis isn't that far fetched, actually, because if you read his life story, he, you know, he left his family as the he was the prince. He was going to be the king. He had this family and all these responsibilities. He left that life behind and became a religious, you know, ascetic yogi meditator. And he tried everything there was to try, and so. It would make sense that he would have tried that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's totally possible. And I'm excited. I think I think part of what can happen is people can have their own direct experience and they can of not just that of all these different things and they can mm-hmm. come to their own opinions and we can shed some of the stigma and some of the cultural conditioning and some of the ideas about it. Yeah. And we can discover new ways and we're in, we're just in this new we're in this new territory. And, even if, uh, you know, whatever happened in India 2,000 years ago, we don't know, but, like, the cannabis that we're growing today in America is actually very different, right? It's been grown and cultivated in all kinds of ways, and we have all these different strands, and so it's an incredible plant. I mean, there's, there's a huge amount of potential there. I think we're just beginning to tap into it, and um, I think part of that is a maturation of our society, because obviously if you're abusing it or overusing it, you're not, that's not good either, and that's totally possible. It's totally possible to be addicted to it and to all these things we're talking about, mm-hmm. like ketamine can be addictive. Oh sure. So there's not like, there's the no, Buddha say, you know, we're all addicted to form. We're all yeah, we're all addicted to <laughs> all kinds of stuff. But there's no, I guess, in my but, opinion, there's no magic bullet. There's um, an exploration that we can find new ways of healing. Like, you know, cannabis is in the medical tradition of Tibet in India as a as a medicine. So it's been there it for was, thousands of years in China. We historically you know, so. know that it used to be used pharmaceutically here in the United States before prohibition. Right before prohibition, yeah. 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 I so mean, I wonder. I wonder how much of the overuse or misuse or whatever you want to talk about it is a result of those attitudes and the prohibition and making it legal. You know, because one hundred percent. One hundred percent. Right. I mean, it's all it's all <coughs> propaganda. I mean, what the the shows that they had out um, back in the what seventies and sixties about you know ma- reefer madness and yeah you know, yeah just, all the propaganda. Blatant, in, like punch in the face propaganda, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, 
I think this is, I, I never came around to saying this, but one of the things that I was so fascinated about working with the vets was like, cannabis is, it, because of everything we're talking about, it's, it's a deprogramming tool. Mm. That's what I was going to get oh, well, with that guy like that. from the cabin in the woods. Or it can be a deprogramming tool. Yeah. If you use it there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like it, <clears throat> it can't be programmed to be in the trance that the other people are in. He oh. sees through yeah. the illusion. <laughs> and, um, and it's all programming. If I remember correctly, he doesn't make it to the end of the movie, but at least he had some insight. <laughs> no, they, none of them did. Oh, none of them? I thought one of them oh, wait, did. Oh, wait, Oh, you're right. None of them. Okay, yeah. He almost no, did. No, no, and it wasn't his fault. <laughs> that's, so funny. that's a funny movie. Everyone should definitely was, watch that movie. It was. Um, but it, it's a, it deprograms you, meaning that yeah. where you've compartmentalized your life, it starts to decompartmentalize you. Yeah. And where you've, um, you know, you're like, in a trance, it starts to detrance you, mm. and uh, you know, and that's what you know. With vets, they've been militarily programmed, and you know that's what we're seeing. It was like that programming mm. coming very ex- undone. Yeah, wow. Because they've been very explicitly, uh, very intentionally programmed. programmed. Right. Very intentionally programmed. It's like, and you could just see it. You could see the the the, the program. Wow. It's and it's yeah, at the time, and I didn't say anything about it because I was like, "Oh shit!" I mean, like, if I say that, is somebody gonna go? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you can't tell people that. Yeah, it's pretty radical to think about. I mean, mm-hmm. we've all been programmed. Um, mm-hmm. Not all the programs are, you know, some are better or worse than others. But to be able to see them as programs, to be able to see the conditioning, mm-hmm. and have some access to it, take it. It's not easy. Like most, you know, it takes effort. It takes some inner work, right? But um, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was gonna say I didn't expect this conversation conversation to go here exactly, but I'm starting to think about things like this in terms of what serves life. Like what is like life is this bigger force that's moving through all of us. And in that sense we're all one. We're all this life force. And what serves that? How does it want to express what what serves greater love, light, caring, kindness, and and like let that question kind of guide me. Rather than let's make all these rules and regulations and try to achieve, you know, manipulate things that come out a certain way. It's like, let's like let that, all that shit go. And like, what's, serve, what's serving life right now? Mm-hmm. You know, what wants to come through right now? Yeah. And yeah. one of the biggest things that would serve life right now is for us to process our shadow. <laughs> and I know there's so many people talking about it, but yeah. it's like, what does that mean? It mm. kind of goes back to that, you know, that inner perpetrator. Yeah. That's because good... there's freedom and wholesomeness on the other side of that. Mm. Well, there are people talking more and more about shadow work, and but yeah, just it doesn't seem like our mainstream media and culture is there yet. Like, they're not really asking that question of like, let's look at our inner perpetrator. It's all about like, oh, this guy, look at how terrible he is, and they're just they know. just are looking for consumers. Right, right. They just are wanting to keep you in a place where you want to consume something. Mm. That's I mean that's right. It's that's that's one of the big underlying things here. Mm-hmm. Our whole society. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> why would you? Why would you listen to mainstream media for what <laughs> serves life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I smoke too much weed. <laughs> uh, well, it, it's sad that we built this whole culture that's so advanced and sophisticated and so wealthy, and yet so much of our energy and resources is going to just creating more and more consuming and consumers. And yeah, it's, but it's, uh, <laughs> but it's like one of those things where it just gets. It's like a balance, you know, like we talk about, oh, we're, we're, um, we're doing all these things that are just, you know, covering our planet in garbage, right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, at an extreme, you know, it's going to suffocate the planet. We're we're going to suffocate ourselves. I mean, there's a, for every action, there's a reaction. So it's Mm. like, we're building up this, um, you know, mountain of plastic and, there's another reaction that's coming up. And I think that yeah. reaction, I mean, a big part of that reaction anyway, is psychedelics. Mm-hmm. And it's going to, I think it's going to be messy. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, you can't stop yeah. it. Yeah. It's not stoppable. I've heard someone talk about psychedelics are like, the part of why they're becoming more commonly known and talked about and popular. It's like the Earth's immune system like popping up to like 
kind of check <laughs> humanity's yeah. excesses. Or, or like, um, hey, <laughs> our, it's like our subconscious, like poking through in a dream yeah. saying, hey, you really need to work on this. Yeah. Whew. Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's been mm-hmm. great. It's fun. <laughs> Maybe this is a good place to end it. <laughs> yeah. So Where can people go. find you online? Um, so our innate path is, is the group of therapists training and we're going to be doing some new projects too. So, um, can't talk about them yet, but, uh, the website is innatepath.org. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you found value in this podcast, there are many ways you can support it. And one of the easiest and best is to just share it with friends, family, and post about it on your own social media accounts. That really helps the podcast a lot. You can leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts and now on Spotify Podcasts. And of course, you can join our Patreon community, patreon.com backslash a state of mind, where you will receive access to guided meditations from me, additional music and artwork, other goodies that are in the works. So check that out. And learn more about my work as a therapist and meditation teacher at estateofmindcounseling.org. Thank you so much, and I will see you here next time.